Dr. Brandt, speaking on Looking at Your Emotions, Dr. Brandt. I've been saying that the fellow that comes around because he's anxious or he can't relax or he can't sleep or he can't eat, can't get along with people, tells a fairly common story. And that story has to do in part with the way he acts, what he knows about himself in terms of what he does. It has to do in part with the way he talks, what he says, what he's willing to listen to. Now that may sound simple, and it is. I'm reminded of a statement that Paul made, the Apostle Paul, when he said, I pray that Satan would not beguile you from the simplicity which is in the gospel. We'd like to make our lives complex and complicated, and uh, we'd like to talk about the multiplicity of uh, people and how different everybody is. But I am emphasizing these days how similar we are and how common our needs are and how easily you can identify with somebody else's experiences. Today, I want to talk about another area that is not easy for people to reveal, the area of the inner life. And even though people find it relatively easy to talk about what they do or what they say, this area of the way you react is certainly, I believe, by far the most important area for us to pay attention to. I'd like to read a passage of scripture here that has been a very meaningful one to me. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and it starts with a fourth verse. To me, this is the essence of the Christian life. It says, such trust have we through Christ Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. And that statement right there gets a lot of people's backs up. There you go telling me I'm inadequate again. That's the trouble with most preachers. They keep running us down all of the time. You can point out how adequate you are and you have achieved and you can prove it. You can show me your assets and your net worth and obviously you have some. You did get your education. And you can say, and rightly so, I did this all by myself. What do you mean I'm inadequate? I am a gentleman. I can conform to the etiquette book and I can do this by myself. I don't need any help. And that's true. Certainly there are areas of our lives where we're quite adequate and quite self-sufficient. Well, then what does this mean when it says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. I'm saying that we are inadequate and insufficient when it comes to matters of the spirit, the inner life. This is the area of your life that's not observable. You can be quite annoyed at someone and walk up to him and say, hello, glad to see you, and you aren't either. Now, you certainly can improve your ability to look glad We surely do have the capacity to improve our acting ability. But I suppose all of us have had this kind of experience, haven't we, where we've had one of those wah, 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 kind of evenings at our house and then a the doorbell rings. <clears throat> and what do you do? Do you walk up to the door and say, uh, what do you want? That's the way you've been talking to each other. 
I don't get greeted that way at the door. I suppose you do what everybody else does. You wipe the frown off your face. Your wife does too. And on the way to the door, you warn the kids. <laughs> and you open the door like everybody else. Well, come on in. And by then, your wife's all smiles. And you just have a delightful evening with your company. Have you ever had that experience? Then pretty soon it's time for your company to go home. And there you are standing in the door with your arm around your wife waving bye. <laughs> and the man <clears throat> says to his wife on the way to the car, now there's a happy couple. <clears throat> So he gets in the car and looks at his wife a little accusingly and says, why can't we get along the way they do? <clears throat> and then as the car drives away and you're still waving, you can close the door and, and pick up right where you left off. <laughs> That's not an unusual thing, is it? Now, the point I'm saying is that we are insufficient when it comes to matters of the spirit. A young lady told me once, I know what you mean, Doc. I, I made up my mind once I was going to be in a good mood tomorrow all day long. She was a college student, and she lived in a dormitory that involved going up to her room in an elevator. Mind you, now, tomorrow morning I'm going to be in a good mood all day long. She woke up, and her alarm hadn't gone off. You know, she was disgusted, and she hadn't gotten out of bed yet. This is the girl that was going to be in a good mood all day. And in her hurry, because she was late, uh, in her hurry to lace up her shoes, she broke a shoelace. So she was already quite, quite annoyed with the world uh, before she got out of her room. And then she did get out of her room, heading for the elevator. And just as she got to the elevator, it closes right in front of her nose. And there she is sputtering at that door. This is the girl who said, I'm going to be in a good mood all day long tomorrow. And a lot of us realize that our response to life can be pretty negative. And a lot of folks say that I seem to be at the mercy of what other people do. Just this week, I had a couple come to see me, a well-educated man a talented fellow who holds a good deal of responsibility at work. And she's a lovely woman, a beautiful woman. But those people are so antagonistic toward each other that he had to move out. Now, it isn't that he's not educated. And it's not that they are not able to function in society. But he says to me, that woman just burns me up. See, the idea is, Doc, uh, how could you change that woman so that I can be happy? Now, that's a, a novel idea, isn't it? How can you change my wife so that I can be happy? That's sort of like sending your wife to the dentist because you have a cavity. He says, I get along with everybody else. She's the only one that stirs me up. Well, you see, the question is, does she put that hostility into him or does she bring it out of him? That's an important question, isn't it? When somebody burns you up, do they stir up something that is in you or do they put it into you? That's an important question because if they put it into you, then you ought to change the other people. But if they stir up what's in you, then we'd better deal with you. Here is this cultured, educated gentleman carrying a good deal of responsibility who is quite inadequate when it comes to developing a relationship with his wife. In the area of the spirit, he hasn't got it. Now, that's what the scripture is trying to say, I believe, that uh, you are insufficient when it comes to matters of the spirit. It's here that we need to be saved from ourselves. 
You read on a little bit in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It talks about our ministry. Mind you, in the, in the verse that I was reading before, it says that God will make you an able minister of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. He'll make you an able minister of the New Testament. A, a ministry of the Spirit. It's in this area that we really minister to people, in the, in the realm of the Spirit. Now, in the fourth verse, it says, Seeing, therefore, that we have this ministry. What ministry? What ministry? It's easy to miss that point, isn't it? Seeing that we have this ministry. That is, my ministry is to love you. My ministry is to respond to you with compassion and tenderness in my heart, which has nothing to do with you. And how I respond to you is my problem. It doesn't have anything to do with you. How I respond to you depends upon my relationship to God. It does not depend upon your conduct. Is that right or wrong? That's either a serious error or a tremendous truth. You know, if that's true, what a truth that is, that my response to you is a matter between God and me and not a matter of your conduct. My ministry is to love you and my love for you is as unmerited as God's love for me. Your ministry to your partner is to love her and be, to have a spirit of kindness and gentleness and peace and joy toward her, which has nothing to do with her or how she receives it. It is said of Jesus that when he, he came down here, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. And so what did Jesus do when he realized that the people he came to lay down his life for, mind you, didn't receive him? Did he go off and sulk? Did he say, God, you goofed. These people don't want me. I'm coming up again. He laid down his life for people who rejected him. Now, there is a real test. So our interaction with people really is a matter of, of revealing our spirit, not causing it. That's either a serious error that I just made, or it's a tremendous truth. And if it's true, it's the message of the day. Well, we have this ministry of the spirit. And here's a description of the way a man conducts himself if he has this spirit. He has renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness. He doesn't maneuver people. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by a manifestation of the truth. He's a man of truth. Commending himself unto a man's conscience in the fear of God. I think this is very important that we realize that our ministry is a ministry to a man's conscience. My interaction with you, as far as I'm concerned, needs to get underneath your skin. If I haven't gotten at your heart, if I haven't reached your conscience, I've missed. I'm not so much concerned how suave our conversation was or how delightful our conversation was. If I didn't get at your conscience, I missed. So this is the goal we ought to have. Now, this man whose ministry is a ministry of the Spirit has renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Did you ever stop to think that dishonesty is invisible? Do you know what a dishonest man looks like? 
like an honest man. You can't tell them apart. But I'll tell you, dishonesty can sure get your life fouled up. Let me give you an illustration. This young fellow and his wife, handsome, successful fellow he was, an engineer, done, doing very well, and his wife was a fine secretary. And during their courtship days, they spent their time looking for a building site, and they found a lovely lot on the side of a hill with a beautiful vista. And then they found an architect and they spent their time designing their dream house and built it. Oh, maybe a twenty-five, thirty thousand dollar house. And furnished it. And then they were ready to get married. Now, how's that for a good start? Why, you'd think that what else would be required? Here's a young couple with a house built and it's furnished, the lawn is in, the driveway is in, a new car in a driveway, and now they're ready to get married. Uh, you go inside that house and this beautiful living room with a lovely vista out there, stereophonic music in the background, electric kitchen, how could you miss? You know, before they were married six months, they were in my office. And they said, we don't have any, any serious fights, but there's a coldness has crept in between us. We can't stand each other. I can't stand for him to touch me. These are the two folks who just a few months before, when they looked at each other, even he, he'd say, well, you just make me tingle all over. And she says, me too. And now this lovely house isn't big enough for the two of them. These are the same two people. Well, this is what happened. He came home one night, this meticulous fellow, clean living. And up there in a corner was a cobweb. A cobweb. And this really shook him. She must have overlooked it. So he didn't say anything about it, and uh, he did what any fine young bridegroom would do. He took his wife in his arms and kissed her and told her he loved her, and he was glad he was married to her. That's what you do. Well, he came home the second night, and that cobweb was still there. But he did the standard things that you're supposed to do. And the third and the fourth night he came home, and it was still there, and by now he was getting kind of mad. But a young bridegroom doesn't uh, shout around the place, so he still continued to do what you're supposed to do. He acted like a loving bridegroom, but now when he was kissing her, he was doing it with his eye on that cobweb. And the sixth day, he was really disgusted with her, but he didn't show it. Now, you see, the important thing is that you don't show it, right? Now, if you're annoyed, it's all right to be annoyed, but for your testimony's sake, act like you aren't annoyed. True? Is that right? If you don't feel like a Christian, at least you can look like one. The important thing is the way you look, isn't it? Or is it? Well, anyway, he was very careful to do the standard things, and he said the right things. Well, finally, he took it for seven days, and on the eighth night, he, he called her in, and he said, Do you see that cobweb up there? Do you know how long that's been there? This is the eighth day. Do you know what she said? What would you have said? I suppose by now you've all taken sides. <clears throat> she put her arms around him and she kissed him and, and she said, Honey, I'm so glad I'm married to you. I'm going to be a better woman because I'm married to you. And wasn't that sweet? And he felt like a heel because look at how disgusted he was and look how nice she took it. 
But do you know what she said on her way to the kitchen to get the broom? She said to herself, boy, I sure wish he'd mind his own business. But by the time she came back, she had her smile back on her face and she just very brightly whisked away the cobweb and he was ashamed. Well, it wasn't long after that, he was standing in a kitchen watching his wife do dishes. And she was washing away, putting the dishes on the dish drainer. Now, this young fellow was an efficiency expert. <laughs> that was his work. And the longer he watched her do those dishes, the more disgusted he got. And finally, after some days, he, he said to her, and he did it real well, really, at hiding his disgust. He said to her, honey, do you realize that you're washing dishes cross-handed? Why, that's the cardinal sin of inefficiency. And to make matters worse, she said, cross-handed? What's that? <laughs> well, he tried as best he could to, to be patient with her, and, and, but he, he said, now you see, if, if you took your dish drainer from over here and put it over here, and then instead of crossing over your body like that, see, all you have to do is this. You see how much more efficient that is? Well, do you know what she said? What would you have said? Well, she wiped her, her hands on her apron and she put her arms around him and kissed him. And she said, honey, I sure appreciate that advice. I'd have never thought of that myself. And again, he felt like a heel. Here he was, so disgruntled with her. You see, I'm talking about the spirit of a man. He looked like the satisfied bridegroom. And she looked like the appreciative wife. Do you know what she said to the dishwater? <laughs> she said, brother, is he going to be telling me how to run my kitchen? Well, because she was so appreciative of his help, he started looking around for other ways of helping her. <laughs> well, now I ask you, what's the matter with that? Here's a fellow, mind you, who simply believes his wife. Think of that. He believes her. Is there anything wrong with believing your wife? Supposing your husband believed you, all he needed to do is to take you at your word. Would he be getting an accurate picture of you? Or let's turn it around the other way, sir. Supposing your wife simply took you at your word. I think that many of the difficulties and the problems in this world are simply based on the fact that a man took another man at his word. And you cannot look at a man and decide whether he's telling you the truth. Truthfulness is a matter of the spirit. It's not a verbal thing. You can't discern whether a man's words are accurate or not. And a lot of us cause ourselves a good deal of anxiety simply because we try to become mind readers and we say to ourselves, I wonder what he meant by what he said. Well, he found several things that he could do to alter her kitchen and make it more efficient. And every time she was so appreciative. Well, one night he came home from work and, and up there in the corner, uh, you guessed it, was a cobweb. And he watched it the standard seven days. <clears throat> and at the end of the eighth day, he brought her into the living room and he pointed out that cobweb. Mind you, this is our quiet, sedate, appreciative wife. You know what she said? She said, I'm getting sick and tired of having you telling me what to do. Woo! What happened to her? 
It is pretty thing. Her hair was in order. She looked nice. She just blew up. It's interesting. People say I blew up. I'm upset. I'm beside myself. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? <clears throat> I broke down these interesting terms that we use to describe ourselves, which simply means I'm mad. I'm disgusted. I'm, I resent and resist life. That's really all we're saying. Uh, these people whose, whose nerves broke down. Their nerves are all right. Here's a young lady that blew up. But you and I aren't surprised. We saw it coming. Wouldn't it be great if we could see into people's lives? But we can't. But sooner or later, light will somehow tear off your mask, won't it? Well, he never opened up his mouth again, believe me, about cobwebs. But what he did do was, when he came home, he just sort of quickly sweep the ceiling with his eyes to see how everything was. And this is what his wife said. I, I like to be, give him a warm welcome. But when he drives in a driveway and I go to the door and I see those eyeballs of his sweep the room, <laughs> it just burns me up. I just can't respond to him. That's not an unusual problem, is it? Uh, a few years ago, there was a song, I think, described it very well, when it, when it says, there's a wall between us, and it's not made of stone. And the more we are together, the more we are alone. That's what was wrong with them. Here's a young man who would like to tell himself that he loves his wife, he adores his wife, his heart is filled with tenderness and gentleness and compassion toward her, but it isn't so. And then a young man sometimes says to himself, I must have married the wrong woman. This woman doesn't stimulate in me what I thought it would. And lots of us think that the way that you're going to find love is to expose yourself to some human being. And all of us who are married know better than that, don't we? This beautiful, gorgeous lady that I married that can stimulate uh, these uh, tingly feelings in me is somebody that I can't stand anymore. No, another person isn't going to change your heart, no matter how seriously you wished it would. But it doesn't, does it? She had the same problem. He burns me up. That's an interesting term, isn't it? He burns me up. He says, she turns me cold, and she says, he burns me up. <clears throat> oh, this misconception of if uh, maybe I married the wrong man. He doesn't stimulate these tender feelings in me that I thought he would. Some people think that about childhood, don't they? They dream about their baby, this soft, cuddly, warm, sweet little thing. And then it comes. And it smells. <laughs> and it has a reversible stomach. And it yells. I can remember saying to my wife, you take it. I can remember uh, this yelling, screaming baby of mine, and I'm walking the floor. Couldn't get my wife to do it anymore. <laughs> and I just sort of could see myself carrying it around like that. <laughs> this is the little brat that I'm supposed to be delighted about. And I'm not. 
and I found out that my children didn't make a nice man out of me. And my wife didn't make a nice man out of me. I needed something besides a wife. And I needed something besides a family. Because somehow or other, they didn't transform my heart. Have you found that out? Wherein are you insufficient? You are insufficient when it comes to matters of the spirit. Only God can help you there. And as I say, I believe this is the nub of our ministry, helping men to realize their helplessness and why they're helpless. It certainly isn't true that we are helpless when it comes to matters of economics, when it comes to matters of education, when it comes to matters of organization. There we're quite sufficient unto ourselves but it is in the matter of the spirit, your emotional response to people. But a man who walks in the spirit has this drive within him. He has renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. They heard it, but... To fill his heart with a spirit that is God's alone. It's reaching out an empty hand and that's an awfully hard thing for a professional man to accept, that I'd have a weakness, isn't it? That's a pretty hard thing for a successful businessman to accept. Me, look it, I can take you out and show you my, my acquisitions. And I can take you out and show you mine, too. Take us a couple of days to do it, too. But I want to tell you that between me and my partners, we have a real weakness. And that weakness for all of us is in the matter of the spirit. Now, what a tremendous message to realize that there's an answer and there's a source. There's a source of, of power that will, will transform your heart and will fill it with joy. What was this young man's problem? This young engineer. Well, he was simply an angry man, that's all. He was a hostile young man. That's pretty hard to swallow. You know, when you can live up to the etiquette book, you know what's proper and you can do it and you do it, and you're successful? Somebody comes along and says, you're a hostile, angry man. Well, that's what he was. Well, that's not easy to take. And this man needed to admit it, and he needed to repent, and he needed to recognize the fact that if he was going to be anything else, he had to yield his life to God. This was not a marital problem. That's one of the good things about marriage. Marriage will reveal your spirit, won't it? Now, some of us would like to say that marriage caused my spirit. I say marriage simply reveals it. What about this beautiful young lady? Well, she was a stubborn beauty. She had a stubborn streak. She was a phony. He annoyed her. But she could just sparkle with appreciation, covering up her annoyance with a delightful flashing smile. But she was just as annoyed, even though she covered it with that flashing smile. And here was a deceitful, stubborn woman right? That's strong language, isn't it? But it was true. And here's a woman who had to repent for her sins. She was so preoccupied with her husband's sins that she couldn't think of her own. He was so preoccupied with his wife's sins that he couldn't think of his own. 
So here's two people, each of them had their own personal problem, and in each case it was a, a flaw in the spirit of a man. And they had to repent. Now at the point where they could approach each other in a proper spirit, in God's spirit, they didn't need me anymore. And you know, that's one of the joys of being a Christian and a counselor. That once you help people tap this resource, that they can pick it up from there and work out their own lives. It's a miracle. And this is our message. Great story, isn't it, that we've got to tell. Well, let's pray. Lord, I've prayed that you would reach people's consciences through these lips. And as that has happened, I do pray that you would help each of us to acknowledge what's true, that we might rejoice in our victories, and that we might go scurrying to you in our weakness. Help us that we might not ignore the light that you've shed in our path. We pray in Jesus' name.